Meet the Farmer TV is made possible by the generous support of Planet Earth Diversified, Makia Video Productions, and Frank Melly Productions, with additional support from Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture. So here we are in December, Central Virginia. The frost has killed the hot peppers. You can see lots of a row of dead pepper plants here, but we've removed that crop and incorporated that into the soil in these raised beds, and we have rows and rows of collard greens, spinach, kale, crops that will grow all winter. So many people think local food means only seasonal, but here you'll see even in December we have fresh spinach available. So here you'll see a special system, a raised bed, crops that are grown in cold, cold weather. They might even have frost or ice crystals on them in the morning. These were planted before the frost came so that they germinated and grew, but they will continue to grow through the winter, surviving the snow, surviving the frost, all the way up until spring where they will sprout flowers and that will be the end of this crop and we'll start the summer crop. And here we are with beet greens that will grow all winter long. Here we are with turnips. And here's a baby turnip and turnip greens. Here we have some beautiful red baby kale. We can pick tiny baby leaves or let them grow large. But we will have greens throughout the winter, delicious and nutritious. So when we grow those microgreens in the greenhouse, and we'll look at that in a little bit, we take the roots out here mm -hmm. uh, and we recycle them. And so okay. we put, these are things we cut yesterday, and we brought them back out, we roll them in, and we water them in. Uh, and, you know, in the wintertime, it's kind of hard, because right. they, they may or may not grow well, but some of the things do. So you can see we have uh, larger collard leaves here. Uh, these are bigger mizuna leaves. Right. And so we, these are what we sell as the field greens um, that are, you know, much lower price, right. but they're tougher and grittier, right. and we have to wash them. So what does top soil look like when it's uh, fully grown? Well, we have some heads over here, we just step over into this, and you can see these are, are uh, a little Rosetta Tatsoi. Oh, okay. And this will get a dinner plate size, and they can still be really nice for, for a little braised green on a dish or something. Right. So let's go in and look inside in the greenhouse, and we'll see how we grow those micros so that they're clean and fresh and ready to eat, and how we cut them right into the box for your, that sounds for great. your line. Okay, Jeff, here we are in the hydroponic greenhouse. Uh, and we're looking at some uh, shangiku and some basil, uh, some of your violas, the edible flowers that you use, uh, the chives. And this system is a recirculating water system where these plants are actually growing in a special nutrient solution we mix up, mix up and maintain every day. Uh, and we grow uh, the little plants and put them in these tubes and uh, continuously rotate them so we'll have uh, between four and six crops of everything that okay. you need in various stages, stages so that twice a week we can pick it and have something for you. So how long does it take to go from seedling to, or are you planting them from the seeds? Yeah, we actually What's plant them from seeds. We've got some mist boxes here. Uh, you can see some trays of microgreens here. So this is a tray of micro celery. Okay. Uh, this is about two weeks. Okay. Wow. Uh, this basil here is probably about two months. Okay. So the thing is, when we change, if we decide, like, like you look at the purple basil there and say, oh, I'm going to start using that purple basil. Right. Mike, bring me purple basil from now on. Now, six weeks from now, now, now we'll have that much purple basil okay. Okay. to bring you in. Then we'll have a series of, of that. Uh, and that's one of the things we, we have to do in working together is though you could make a phone call and, and find some around, and we've got some, right. but to switch your entire production, production over, over to we have to start this cycle okay. all over again. Here are some Thai basil flowers you might use. And don't you make a simple syrup from the, the yes, we leaves? Did. We grew some sage here uh, in these tubes, but also when we go down to the tomato house, you'll see some sage in pots okay. and soil down there. Uh, but we grew some up here because we can get uh, a little bit more tender leaf when you want specific leaves. And we have some customers that want these two leaves. And they're going to take those two leaves 
And they put them behind a, a rabbit fillet. Oh, okay. So like rabbit ears. Right. But we have to have these nice, perfect, perfect flat straight leaves. leaves. And here we have some opal basil. Um, again, it's it makes a beautiful garnish top. I love you can frying take them. Just, you, know, you get these really nice. And I like deep frying them and put them on top of fish. Oh, really? A little salt and pepper. That's interesting. I'd like to see that. So you can see the nice quality and cleanliness that we have because these things are two and a half, three feet off the ground. Correct. We're keeping the floors clean. We can actually wash the crop uh, with our hydrogen peroxide water hose, uh, let it dry, and then harvest for you. Oh, okay. So the stuff we bring to you is ready to eat. 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 You don't have to be washing. You know, if we were growing this outside and dirt was splashing up, uh, we wouldn't have that same level of quality. Now, do you do it when you grow everything? Do you do it in a specific area, or is it just, it doesn't matter when you're doing it hydroponically where it's growing, what's next to it? Well, we try, we do have, there's, you can see we have yellow lights and blue lights. Mm -hmm. And the yellow lights tend to stimulate flowering. Okay. So we try to move things that we want to flower under that yellow light. And you can see how the basil that's getting some of that yellow light has got flowers on it. Right. We don't really want those basil flowers. Okay. But we do have a few people that want those white basil flowers. Okay. We have to grow a few of them. Uh, so we try to get the bulk of our basil going down here under the bluer light. Uh, where it doesn't stimulate so much of the flower. Okay. I mean, you can actually see how that, that one edge of the nice the full. bed that's toward the yellow, it's the, the flowers are just reaching, reaching for that yellow light. And these are some of the violas we grow for you. Okay. These are edible flowers. I've noticed they're in the chives. How do they end up in the chives? Yeah, these, uh, we usually grow them in this bed right here. This is one of the areas we reserve just for you guys. and. Well, our last crop made some seeds that jumped over into the, okay. the chives, uh, and it was actually worked out well because we were running kind of low on the, the flour, so we left them in the <laughs> chives, and now they seem pretty happy. Right. Uh, and we're actually getting two sizes. We get slightly larger, larger. ones uh, from these growing companion with the chives, and uh, smaller ones uh, there individually in the tubes. So right in here, we've just got some stems where the flowers were cut. So you can see, even though there is this bed, it's not like somebody goes through with a mower and cuts all those. Each flower is individually cut and put in that box. Okay. Now what are the differences between the troughs and the tubes? The tube system here, we have just a, a flowing nutrient solution. And the plants are actually just bare roots in little uh, fiber cubes. And they're growing right in this, okay. this recirculating water solution. Now, if you put plants just in a puck, bucket of water, they die because they wouldn't get oxygen. Okay. So this recirculating system, there's some filters down there. We're monitoring pH and conductivity and nutrient levels. Uh, we do several scientific tests on the, the water each day. Uh, but with that keeps that water solution, what's called the, the, um, the soil solution. So even if that plant was growing out in the soil, there would be this film of liquid around the soil particles. And the plant roots really don't know that much difference that there's not those soil particles. Oh, okay. But chives, they grow in these clumps. And okay. they're not gonna do very well in these, in these tubes. So we put them in a, a, an inert medium. It's actually expanded obsidian gravel. Okay. And so they're able to grow in these trays and there's a little dripper up at one end, and it puts a small amount, I think about a gallon per hour okay. of water, and that runs through, wicks through this media, and allows the, the chives to grow in the way that they would be happiest in clumps okay. and uh, spreading. But you can see these nice, healthy, happy roots. roots. And we're able to wash these things uh, much cleaner than if we were growing them out in the, in soil. The, in the soil. But our whole goal is to to replicate what the plant sees as that solution around the soil particles so that their roots are, are happy, the plants are happy, and they're growing in an environment where they can thrive and they're not large raindrops or birds or insects chomping on these flowers, right. hurting the yield and, and making uh, a product that's not usable to right. you. But there is a huge investment in that we've built this building around it and we've got the energy and, and, and monitoring uh, of all of the, this. 
the technology to make that happen for us. Well, Jeff, let's talk about a, a few of the things that uh, we grow especially for you, uh, just to kind of get warmed up on it. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about here uh, is we grow these mint garnishes for you and we, we very specifically cut these little tops uh, just just like that. And But we also can, can provide you bulk mint if you're trying to do uh, mint extracts or uh, simple syrups or uh, you know if you just need it for cooking. Is that a good size or is there you know is that right for your garnish? Is there something else you'd like to have? Uh, we like the, we like the smaller ones just for you know exactly like you said a, a, a garnish. To me the fuller leaves have more flavor uh, not that these don't have much flavor but it's just the right compact size for a garnish and for people to actually eat with the desserts put them on soups uh, with lamb dishes every now and then. So I mean, overall, it's a great size. Do you use them in drinks too? Uh, we would, um, but we don't do a whole lot of mint juleps or any of those okay. things here. But uh, you know, it, it's a great garnish. You know, we can pull off one leaf at a time and you know add it, and it's exactly. the perfect size versus the large leaves. It doesn't okay. overpower Good. thing. We used to get the uh, the skewers also from you to use them for uh, skewered scallops and shrimp. That's right, those long it's skewers. All the flavors in there. Well, that's good. Now, I know we do uh, cut these the day we bring them to you, uh, and we actually cut them and, and set them right down there in that box. Uh, but I know there have probably been people bringing you, you know, big quantities of, of microgreens uh, swinging around in a bag at a much lower price. Do they just not work for you? Or? Well, I mean, it, it could work for me, but it's, it's not really what we try to go for at Blue Light. We try to give the best of the best. And uh, being a fresh seafood restaurant, you know, it's... it's you know, it's just it goes it goes well with what we're trying to do, and uh, by getting them large, and and the big bags, it's kind of just cut a corner, and you don't get the quality nor the taste factors that are involved in the actually hand picked true microgreens. That's right. Good. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the cost issues. Well, cost issues, you know, it, especially in this time of day, it's. You know, it's kind of a hard, hard economy right now, and I've always had the value of if you support locally, then they're supporting me, we're supporting you guys, and everybody that buys it is essentially supporting you guys. So, to compare a couple dollars a pound to our management is hard for them to see because all they really see is the bottom line, but once they actually come in and taste it, they normally will look at it and, and it's kind of... Uh, that's the word I'm looking for. It's, uh, it's kind of understood that the quality is there for the price. It's, it's kind of like buying sashimi grade tuna versus frozen tuna. It's a much better product, and you can tell that it's a better product, even though the price is higher. Now, you buy a lot of local seafood or from a local seafood uh, purveyor. Since we're in the mountains, we're not really right. local seafood. Tell me a little bit about how you, you find that same quality of the seafood. Well, I mean, it's, to me, it's more of a gratification. I, I grew up in Michigan and had fresh local, uh, you know, fresh lake food, seafood, and, you know, with the walleye and things like that. And then I, I grew up cooking-wise in uh, the Charleston area, so it's a constant supply of, of fresh fish. And incorporating the fresh fish into, you know, you know, a lot of people look at the vegetables as kind of the side dish. And to me... I'm not much of a starch person, used to be a big starch person. To me, I'd rather have exceptional to the highest quality possible seafood that I can find and have the highest quality, you know, vegetables, herbs, all those type things. So really it's, it's along the same lines of buying fresh seafood, of why buy seafood from, you know, a Mexican company or all the way on down, uh, you know, to Brazil, you find a lot of things that are coming off those coasts. Ooh. It's not supporting anything local when you do that, right. even though it is at a cheaper cost. Yeah. But you you lack you lack the quality on most of the things. Right. You go cheaper. To me, it's like I don't know if you really can say it. It's like buying a Cadillac versus buying a Kia. The Kia is cheaper, and yes, it kind of does the same thing. It'll make you full. You know, it gets you to and from work. But driving the Cadillac. 
you know you're driving a Cadillac, you know you have a very well-made car, and not a whole lot of things are going to go wrong in my mind. So it's interesting to me, most of the accountants only see all this stuff on a spreadsheet. And they just see food costs and a percentage, and they're probably just pounding on you with these numbers. Right. How do you actually, do you have them come down and, and eat some of the food? Do you show them like, well, here is the, the $1 tomato and here's the $2 tomato. Which one do you want to eat? Right. Well, m m most of our manage management, with the exception of the accountants, you know, uh, have been chefs and know more about sustainable agriculture. And uh, so it's a li little easier to sway them on the price. Uh, but like you said, the accountants look at a percentage base. And I constantly tell them that it's you don't put a percentage in the bank. It's more of what you put profit-wise in the bank. And if you want to compete on a level of culinary cuisine that is at the highest possible that we could do in this town, you know, with, with being one of the premier uh, seafood restaurants, then you have to serve the best of the best. You can't you can't get away with serving anything less than that. Otherwise, then you're just a mediocre seafood joint. And uh, so, while it is a struggle, it's slowly starting to turn that way to where they understand what's really going on. Well, that's good. Now, we were talking a little bit about this relationship where we basically got together and, and took some of those number pressures, and uh, rather than canceling orders or cutting way back, I said, well, look, let me get you the same stuff you, you want and you need. We'll lower the price if we get a commitment from you for this sort of you know continuous standing order, uh, and then we can massage that. Uh, but is that, is that uh, a normal thing you, you would do, or is that a, an unusual thing that happens just between the uh, chef and a local farmer? I think, I think it varies from town to town. I think Charlottesville is much more of an uh, organized community in helping each other out. Uh, your larger cities sometimes have a, a harder time lacking in uh, trying to actually form those relationships. So in a, in a town the size of Charlottesville, it's easier to do versus living in Atlanta or Charlotte or Miami. Uh, there's you know, much more demand for this type of agriculture. And uh, you know, it, it's, to me, it's really one of those things where I would rather create relationships with uh, planter diversified in yourself and be able to ask you to grow things that I can't get Charlottesville like you can get in some of those other cities and you guys are able to grow it and do it to the specs that we want and work together to create those type things. And, you know, it's pretty much just a relationship that we work off together where it's hard to create a relationship with somebody over the telephone that's based out of Manassas or DC or Maryland to call them up and be like, listen, this is what I'm really looking for. These are the specifications and this is why I want it and most of those people don't understand or they'll send you mediocre things when really the quality that I'm looking for is far superior than what they probably can even give to me and you guys are able to you know accompany that by sitting down you come you come twice a week and we sit down and we have discussions of you know I, I like it this size but is it possible to get a plant that's this big where most people will just you know you call it and say I want it an inch and a half you know sprig of rosemary and they're going to laugh at you and say we can't do that and or it might be different each week you get it right there are different sizes the consistency is different and with local people we can actually sit down and form that relationship and, and be like this is what i really like this is what you can do if you can't do it then we figure out between you and i how to actually do that and that makes you know the local the local way of going much much better you guys uh must get some benefit uh, from your customers, uh, putting it on the menu that this comes from local. Do you really see people coming in? I mean, there, with all this focus now on Buy Fresh and Buy Local campaign that's right here, uh, Piedmont Environmental Council is just around the corner. Uh, do you see people actually coming in and commenting or asking or, or just some, do you notice any difference with the customers or are they just looking down the menu for the lowest price and ordering a double on the bread? I think it's a 50-50 split. I, th I think you get a lot of people that are conscious about, you know, the whole local movement. And, uh, you know, I, I believe in an ideal world, we would be able to buy everything local, use only things that are fresh to, you know, indigenous to this area or things that can even be grown. But 
unfortunately we're not in a you know economy right now the world that we would love to be in you know i'd love to be able to have the time and and you know be able to give forth enough effort to go out and buy you know fresh cream you know buy local butters you know lo local beef fish you know all those type things and you can't really do that um, you can in some parts of the united states some parts of the world you know you know to that nature but for the most part it's it's more that i found as a chef the easiest way to be able to do that and be able to sustain the local you know the whole scene is is, is to buy local you know vegetations uh, all, all of my herbs all those type of things so i mean ideally we do get probably the 50 50 mix you get the people that want you know we have people that come in that would be willing to spend astronomical amounts of money for food that are able to do that but at the same time at the same time we have to be able to balance out for our business uh, both things because it is more of an expensive uh, type thing price is the only thing that's really quantified about the food right and it really depends on someone like yourself a chef to quantify that other part of what what is the standard of the flavor. I mean, right. if you buy vitamins, you get some milligrams or you right. get some test result from a lab that's supposed to tell you which pill has more of the active right. ingredient. But with the flavor in the food, it really is is up to your artistic decision and you don't ever give a number to the accountants that they can put in that spreadsheet to factor that this $1 thing only has a tenth the flavor. So the two dollar actually is half the cost. Right, and, I, and, I, and to me, I've always had the mind frame, you know, and it's really only been the, the past couple of years since I've really broadened my knowledge and taste buds on things. But a lot of people go by recipes. You can go by recipes on pastries and desserts and those type of things because it is more of a science where you have to have the right proportions on things. And I've been a chef that, you know, people constantly harp on consistency, consistency, consistency. And you can be consistently bad as a company or a restaurant, and you'll still have a ton of people coming to eat your food, but that's what they expect. So when it stays that way, it stays that way. When you buy more of the mass-produced items, you lose a lot of lack in flavor. You know, like the tomatoes are not as robust flavor, not as juicy. They're really mealy and just kind of watery things you're putting in your mouth. It's just something to put on the plate. Right, and so, you know, I've had it time and time again where it's hard to be consistent when you're, when you have a set menu, everything is organic. Everything, you can pick two tomatoes at the same time off the same plant, and they're not gonna taste identically the same. And with that being said, when you're doing that, you can't really create a recipe off of five pounds of this, you know, a couple teaspoons of this, you know, a pat of butter here, a pat of butter there, because everything in life tastes completely different. Just because you pick one apple off the tree doesn't mean that one on the other side is going to taste identical to that. And I feel like people kind of forget that whole mentality of it's things that are, are grown from the earth, that everything does taste different, that you can't get exactly the same taste off of things. So when that is said, you have to be able to look at the locally type things where they're picked right, right off of the vine versus buying something from California that is, is cheaper, but it's being picked when it's so green. They stick it in a warehouse, they let it ripe, then they put it on a truck. It takes anywhere from four to five days to get over to the East Coast or vice versa. You know, things that are indigenous to the East Coast that go over to the West Coast, and you're not getting the quality or the flavor of what you're really buying. Okay, so what we're really saying here is the only thing that you can consistently get is low quality. So you can either lower your quality standards to where you know you can always get it. You can get something red disc right. that you can call a tomato on a burger. And as long as you don't worry about what it tastes like, you can get it at all kinds of low prices and you can get it any time of the year. But if you're going for that highest quality level, it's very similar to the problem we have. We grow these beautiful microgreens and we show them to you, you go, yeah, I want that every week. And then we're like, oh man, that was the best we've ever done. Now we got to do it all the time. So we kind of share that, that search for excellence. And in this partnership where you agreed 
to continue to support my efforts, and I agree to continue to support your efforts for that that excellent product. Uh, we're both sort of artisans in that right. way. Right. You know, it, it, it's it's. You know, if, if if you're eating a burger and you're eating a frozen patty, and then you, your buddy sit next to you and he just hand ground his own beef that he pulled out of his backyard and he's got, you know, heads of cabbage, because I for some reason he like cabbage on my burgers, yeah. but you know, lettuce, cabbage, whatnot, onions, all those type things, and you're sitting there eating a generic burger that anybody in the United States can eat because it comes out of one warehouse. I'm jealous of the guy sitting next to me eating the homegrown, hand ground type stuff, and I want to eat that. But so that's really what you're trying to provide your right, customers. Right. Something they can only get from you, the chef artist. Right. And you need the same high level ingredients, and you can really only obtain those from a local source that will continue to work with right, you through right. the process. Because you can't, you know, like I said earlier, you, you, I can't, I can't form a relationship with somebody. Especially vegetable-wise, fruit-wise, any of those type things, on the on the West Coast where it grows prominently year-round because of the climate and all those type things, you know, I, I could do it with a fish purveyor on the West Coast, call them up, say, "Listen, I'm not paying you because you didn't send me the right things." Mm -hmm. I can't I can't call them and say, "When exactly that orange is ripe in California, I want you to pick it and send it to me because by the time it gets to me, it's already turned and spoiled, rotten." You know, it's, it's getting mealy, those type things, and it, it's losing the, the vibrance flavor that you get if you live in California and you actually pick it from your tree and you peel it right there and you eat it. So the only places I know on the East Coast in Charlottesville that is a lot colder than I wish it was yeah. is, you know, certain purveyors, you guys being, you know, primarily the main one because a lot of the other people can't keep up with the consistency of the fresh products and they lack the ability to create the relationships that we do. Amanda, tell us about the the, the different things that you use, uh, drinks and simple syrups and uh, a Thai basil syrup, a, a rosemary syrup, and, and there's something called liquid love. Tell us all yes. about that. We have our lemon rosemary martini made with Kettle One Citron and uh, rosemary simple syrup, which we get from Planet Earth Diversified and uh, finished with uh, fresh lemon juice. And this is our liquid love, and that is made with stoli ras and some chambord and fresh lime sours, topped with an edible rose, which we get from Planet Earth Diversify. And uh, finally, we have our uh, basil Hayden. It's our basil square, made with basil Hayden and uh, Thai basil simple syrup. So next week we'll explore the deeper values and hidden benefits of local food systems. We'll also look at how waste products can be recycled into chicken feed. For more information about Meet the Farmer TV, visit our website, meetthefarmer.com. Meet the Farmer TV has been made possible by the generous support of Planet Earth Diversified. Makia Video Productions and Frank Melly Productions With additional support from Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture.